Thank you, Diana. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Zoom people? Do we know? Um, oh, well, I saw someone. I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, uh, Diana, one, one more thing. Um, so please have your phone on silent. Um, so we have today, you know, welcome again. Uh, my name is Iris. I'm teaching and learning at attainment coordinator at CSM. So today uh, we are very, very lucky. We have this amazing panel. Um, before I pass on, you know, the time to them, I want to share my own live to live experience. So I grew up in Hong Kong, as you know, uh, it's a multilingual English and Chinese. And my mother tongue is, you know, is Cantonese, Guangdonghua. But then my generation, I was born many, many, many years ago in the seventies, just to be clear. Uh, when I um, translation, a dictionary translate from English and Chinese is like in every single household. There's about 5.5 billion people in Hong Kong, my generation. Um, so when we start working in the industry, we don't know the vocabulary, we don't know the terms. So we have got something like this. This is when I started uh, work in the fashion industry. It's a dictionary translate from English to Chinese. It's all the terminology about the fashion industry to help us really know what the buyer want, um, uh, um, to understand what they're saying. And uh, some, of, some of the terms in, you know, inside is very interesting. You know, at that time, I really haven't got a clue what it is, why they have Sunday best. <laughs> <laughs> and then they have, uh, I think somewhere inside, you can see is, you know, this our print is in the 80s. Somewhere in the test style, Prince of Wales check. So we save it for another time for this term, why I call Prince of Wales. So I just want, I'm not expert um, in translation, it's my live experience. I always find it so fascinating because, you know, something you cannot just directly translate. I think Nikki can give a, a lecture you know, for this. Um, but then um, Liam Green, he's trying to hide, he came up with this uh, idea to have this panel, we discuss, you know, uh, talk about translation because, you know, it come from, it can be different form, writing, you know, that's why you see we have a diverse panel. So I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Nikki. I'm just to briefly, very brief, introduce uh, each speaker one after one, but then you, you know, please introduce yourself more. Um, Nikki Harmon, my God, Nikki Harmon is no heavyweight. Um, you, uh, Daniel is here. I'm signed on this book. She's a translator. She has got, my God, is it a uh, numberless um, translate so many, so many books to mm. translate? You know, this is one of them. Too many. Is it too many? Never too many. Never, never too many. Um, let me just read it properly. The first, you know, the first one. So Nikki Harmon is an award-winning UK-based translator, passionate about spreading Chinese literature to English. She has brought the like of Siren, Yanzi, Yanji, Yanko. Yanko. Oh, okay. See, I did a new reading glasses. Um, not just my pronunciation, um, translation. Is it is it A E A Y I I, I. and the others, others, others to an inter international audience. So over to you, Nikki. Oh, thank you. It's fantastic to be here in person after years of Zooming. <clears throat> it's a real privilege, so I'm really delighted to be here. I thought the way, the best way of talking about translation is uh, to talk specifically about, about three books, because I can give you examples from each book, and then I hope you'll have lots of questions to ask me afterwards. Anyway, this is the first one. Um, the two by the same author, Jia Pinghua, who's from uh, Xi'an. This is called Happy Dreams, and it's it's in the first person about a, a migrant worker whose name calls himself Happy Liu. And he's an extraordinary Chaplin-esque, really a lot like Charlie Chaplin character. He's kind of pretentious, he's engaging, he's very obnoxious, he's foul-mouthed, he's devious, and when he falls in love, he's also quite tender. 
But this was a really quite difficult book to translate, uh, not only because the environment in which he lived was um, the slums, the slum areas of, of Xi'an, where basically they didn't have any kind of furnishings that you or I would recognize. And it was really quite hard to figure out how he was living, what his cooker was like, for example. And it's a sad fact that if you go on Google Images, the poorer the environment you're researching, the less likely you are to find it on Google Images. But really the main uh, challenge with, with this book was getting this guy's voice. Uh, easier, I suppose, for Jia Pinghua because he's uh, at least a man uh, and he actually knew Happy Liu and he's familiar with the dialect. Um, but for me, the Happy Liu is, is um, a Chinese, uneducated dialect speaker, male and young. Every, different in every way from me. I'm a woman, educated, middle-aged, speak standard English. So I actually found it, uh, I, I really needed to feel happy that I was giving him a voice. And I think any literary translator will say to you that it's getting the voice, which is important. No matter whose voice it is, no matter whether the novel, and this is a great novel, is, um, is in the first person, the third person, even the second person. Um, you really need to be confident that you're giving that uh, person, the protagonist, a voice. A voice that is what the author would have wanted because ultimately the author is your master or mistress. Um, so that's Happy Dreams. Um, next one, uh, the amazing Sinoist publishers are just about to produce this gorgeous edition by the same author, but a very different book. Um, the Sojourn Tea Shop. It's really beautiful. This is the hardback edition. Um, and it's a completely different uh, kettle of fish. I mean, one of the things I like about Jia Pinghua is that he is very versatile. Um, so how can I summarize? Um, it's about a dozen women in uh, a fictional version of Xi'an, which is called Xijing, Western capital. And their struggles to run their businesses. So they're, they're middle class educated, most of them. They're absolutely contemporary. Um, their battles with bureaucracy and corruption and their struggles to find personal happiness. And one of the interesting things about this book was that I translated it with um, Liu Jun, who is a very talented translator of Chinese heritage who lives and works in New Zealand. So all the work we did was actually carried out on email with like a 12 or 13 hour time difference with various Zoom conversations. And um, it was really fascinating because there are themes running through this book apart from the personal lives of the women. And that is um, the Buddhist belief, some of them are Buddhists, and also the tea culture, and that, that they are in many ways very cultured. And one of the things that we had to do was that Liu Jun would give me an awful lot of information about, say, how a fan was painted and the kind of very beautiful fans that they were um, selling in, in the tea shop. And um, the trouble is that what was happening was that this mention of a fan might just be a throwaway remark by one of the women to another woman. So I was being given all this knowledge by Liu Jun, but I couldn't incorporate all this knowledge into the sentence because it was enough for me that I knew the background. If you're translating a novel, you're translating a novel. You're not translating a manual about the history of painted fans. So we had to get a balance between the information 
that I needed and that Liu Jun already had and was happy to give me. Um, also about Buddhist wall paintings, about which I now know far more than I ever dreamed I would know. And making the novel sound like a novel, which was, as I said, what the author would have wanted. So this also, uh, I can't wait to get my own copy. I've just been lent that very temporarily. So I'm going to finish by talking about another um, very different book, a memoir, because there's a particular, two particular points I want to make about it. So this is a memoir by uh, a old guy called Rao Ping Ru, and it is particularly beautiful and I really would encourage anyone to get hold of a copy. It's published by one of the branches of Random House and it's called Our Story, Rao Ping Ru. Uh, they've subtitled it A Memoir of Love and Life in China. Oh, I thought it was lost. Anyway, it's gorgeous, and it was written in memory of his beloved wife, who died before him, and he taught himself to paint, because over his very long life, and he died a couple of years ago, age 96, all his family photos had been lost, and so he taught himself to paint so that he could uh, commemorate their lives together, and it's absolutely fascinating. One reason it's fascinating is that he had what you might call the remnants of a, a Confucian education, because after all, he was born right at the beginning of the 20th century, he went through certain rituals when he began his education and was introduced to his teacher. He was also passionate about a particular classical Li uh, Shangyin, Li Shangyin, Lin Shangyin, anyway. Um, the very famous classical poet who he um, loved and quoted at the beginning of every uh, chapter. And as you can imagine, it's very different translating classical poetry. So that was another difficulty. But also the very funny thing, and the reason why I'm holding this box in my lap, is that some of the things he talked about had me scratching my head and going back to him and asking him questions. One of the questions was, so you say that you tried to make a living in the 1930s when you and your wife were very poor uh, by selling vegetables. What was this mistake that you made? I don't understand it. You diddled yourself out of a whole load of money by underselling a lot of vegetables. I did never get to the end of the story, but I ended up knowing much more about balance scales and how they worked than you could ever believe possible. I still think he made a mistake, but he wasn't going to admit it. Anyway, the story was that he'd put, he'd somehow calibrated this wrong so that the vegetables on that end were selling a tenth of the price they ought to have sold. And so he gave up his career <laughs> of a uh, vegetable seller. The last point I want to make about our story is that it is uh, a seriously beautiful and emotional book. And that aside from the difficulties of translating poetry, uh, the quotes at the beginning of each chapter, the raw emotion and the love that he expresses in this work comes across irrespective of any cultural differences, historical differences, you don't need to know. Every time I get to the end of this book, I find myself moved to tears by his love for his wife and the shadows, the, well, the, their lives were overshadowed by many different events. And how um, through it all, his love and care for her endured. So found in translation, I would encourage everyone to get a copy. Thank you, Nikki. Um, just double checking, you can hear me. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna to move, to move on uh, to my college. He teach at the CSM, uh, BA Graphic Design. So Andrew Lowe. Andrea is fine. Andrea. But it's, you know, oh, but over to my you. My name is Leo, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Over Hello, you. everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, Iris, thank you for inviting me. And Nikki, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And hello uh, to the other panelists as well. So my name is Andrea. I teach here. Actually, this is my teaching room twice a week. So I'm almost home, basically. Um, I teach on the BA Graphic Communication Design. Um, I, I actually teach um, writing mostly to students who need to <clears throat> um to need to write their um their critical reports for their for their degree I, I started teaching when they were writing a dissertation but now we've changed the, the model and they're writing a critical report which is i think more engaged with their um <clears throat> with their graphic design work because they feel they they can actually talk about the work that they do and i'm not i'm not a translator but i live surrounded by translations because um I'm not British. I was born in Italy, so this is you know I, when I speak English and I teach English, I I speak a different language, and sometimes I still find myself translating from the Italian, even if I've been living here for forever. But you know, it's, I'm I will never be confident in speaking English as a first language. But um, I also live with with uh, you know, I I work. And well, I, I said I live because I, I recently I feel that I live here actually more than work. I should probably bring a, a little tent in the office and, and stay there. But I, I, I work surrounded by um, students coming from, from all countries and they, they come with their languages and, and their cultures and, and their concerns for their relationship with the English language and, and the way we use it to communicate to them. So I guess the, the, the reason why I'm not, a, I'm not a translator by any means, but I think I come here with an interest and when, with some questions about the idea of intercultural communication, because we always, that's, that's how we talk about translation on the course. But there are other ways that we talk about translation on the course. And, and, and one of them is the fact that actually um, graphic communication design can be considered a form of translation because at least, I mean, the course is large and we teach a number of disciplines and we, we, uh, we account for a number of disciplines, different disciplines, but in part of the course, some of the students, what they effectively do is um, they, they make information accessible to audiences using their, uh, let's say, visual arts or visual communication skills. So it's a form of translation that is almost, in certain cases, I would say it's totally deverbalized. So the, the, you know, the, the words don't exist anymore, but there is the language of images, of course, that, that we, we consider and we talk about all the time. And I think the, the third point I wanted to make is that um, I think these questions often with the students as well, like they bring these questions to the fore. Um, so I, I'm here probably just to represent the, you know, part of the very rich conversations that um, we have on the course about these issues. Um, the, the idea of um, how, how, how loyal or how ad ad adherent you have to be to an original text or, or an original set of information when you translate and, and, and how much you are instead allowed to express an authorial voice. And I think Nikki was already starting to touch on this here when, we, when she was talking about the translation of our story, I think. Uh, no, no, the, the, the story of the fans, you know, how much information you, you, you need and how much information you, you need to use to make a concept accessible to a completely different culture and using a completely different language. Um, so I, because our students want to be recognized as authors, and Nico was saying earlier how instead when you translate, somehow the original is your, you know, the author, the original author is your master or your mistress. And my, our students want to be recognized as authors of their communications. So I think the, the other issue that we could discuss potentially is the idea of the visibility or invisibility of the, trans, the, the tr both the translator and the translations. So, but, but I'm no expert in this. I am. I'm. I guess I'm a very interested observer, and um, so I'm just here, you know, to mention these ideas and questions, and then hopefully we'll get to talk 
um, about them later through questions from the audience, hopefully. Thank you. This is exactly why you're here. Because, you know, we have um, student uh, course handbook. We have, um, we've been you know, trying to improve, improve how we can make it accessible, translate all this knowledge to make it accessible for all students, not just, uh, you know, we have such a diverse body of students, different learning style. How can we translate it, you know, make it um, easier for, for everyone? Ultimately, we want them to understand. Um, Karen, you know, not, not, not you now, but she teach, you know, um, accessible English. So, you know, this is something, you know, we're doing as well. Um, so thank you. Andrea? Yes, perfect. <laughs> so I'm going to move to next piece. I will never forget uh, her name perfect. I'm just going to call, name, uh, call her Chinese name, Yinju. So Yinju, over to you. Okay, I'm just quickly. Yinju, she is a founder of Translation Cases. She's a, she is a PhD candidate at San Jose Martin. Um, so over to you, Yinju. You can teach me again how to pronounce your name correctly in Korean. <laughs> thank you, Iris. Um... And I gave her permission to <laughs> pronounce my name in Chinese um, way. Um, my name is Hyun or Hyunju. Um, and first of all, um, happy Lunar New Year. And as Iris introduced me, I'm a PhD student here um, studying um, contemporary artist books and their relationship to process driven art. Um, and I'm from Seoul, Korea but I left my country, um, oh, sorry, um, in 2010 to um, study in different locations, including New York, Tokyo, and now I'm here in London. Um, and during that time, I studied art history and developed my practices in interdisciplinary visual art. And just to describe a bit more about my research here, it's as I said, about contemporary artist books published after the 2000s and how they really translate the immaterial values of artistic processes into something concrete with form um, and distributable. So as you can tell, I'm not uh, an expert in translation in any, in any way, but I am exploring the perhaps the larger boundary of the concept of translation. And in such sense, my work is not totally unrelated to translation itself. Um, and I'm here because I started a postgraduate interest group called Translation Cases um, back in September last year. And we, just in case you're curious, we also have an Instagram. It's literally translation.cases. So you can search that um, later if you're interested. But um, what really triggered me to start this group was really purely personal curiosity at first, because um, I realized um, when I was trying to describe my PhD research to my friends and family back in Korea, I lost my words because I couldn't use the right terms. Um, so I sort of realized the asymmetry between the English language and the Korean language in, um, in the knowledge of artist books. And I started committing lots of imperfections I'm trying to explain my research. And um, strangely enough, Korean language does have an advantage of um, transliteration because um, we can transcribe the sounds of foreign languages quite easily. So for example, the keyword in my research, artist books in Korean could just be artist book. Like it would mean the same thing. I would just borrowing the sounds, but I wouldn't say that's like the a good example of like true translation. So still this asymmetry that I'm pointing out is not resolved. And I sort of assumed back then that other people would be experiencing something similar because we are all like, I'm not like English is not my first language, but I'm speaking in English right now. So we are using borrowing English as the lingua franca um, in contemporary days. Um, so I just wanted to learn through this interest group how people are dealing with this asymmetry. And um, I'm starting to learn that this issue is a very common sentiment indeed among many researchers and translators and artists and everyone. Um, 
who works multilingually. And I just wanted to end by sharing um, Hung Duong's essay. He's a Vietnamese translator, writer, um, who will present um, at translation cases this coming month in February 10th. Um, and his essay is titled Asymmetry in Translation and the Need to Name It. And I'll just share some excerpts. It's it's a very, um, I guess, critical piece of the post-colonial domination of English um, as the lingua franca. Um, but yeah. He writes, when I translate, I translate not only words, but also modes of existence. What is the cost of hybridity when translating from the position of a former colony into the language of one of your occupiers? How will moving between languages, especially when um, an asymmetry exists between them, influence our sense of self? Does this constant code switching come at the expense of our integrity? And is this complication inevitable or necessary? If English is to become the world's lingua franca and translators need to forge their existence within this tricky paradigm, how do we balance saying what we need to say and resisting the colonial remnant ideologies, post-war trauma that, stem, that might stem from using English? Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yinju. <laughs> um, okay, so next, my God, Daniel York Lowe. Oh, heavyweight, another one. So I need to, I need to read this. So Daniel, he is Associate Artistic Director at Gagilang Art. Can I say it's formally named, um, it's Ken, yeah? Formerly Chinese Art Now. Yeah, formerly Chinese Art Now, but then now it's Gagilang. One of us, yeah? One of us. So Daniel, um, Daniel is an award-winning performer, writer, and filmmaker. He has worked at the Royal Shakespeare Company, National Theatre, and World Court Theatres, among many others. He plays he, his plays, including included oh this one, Forgotten, Waimon, is based on the experience of the World War One Chinese labor crop. If you still don't know Chinese labor crop. Very important. So I'm going to hand it. Is it me? <laughs> Something I said. <laughs> Over to you, Daniel. I, I just uh, I just hold it there. Okay. Yeah. Um. You be strict with me on that card, yeah, because you know we're going to be here all night if you don't drag me off. Seriously, I I can't go on like this stuff all night. Uh, Kong Si Fa Chai, Wang Shui, Wu Hu Gao Shan. There's a word he's saying Hokkien, which is Hua, which means be prosperous. Uh, that makes me sound like a cultural expert, and I am anything but. Um, I so I became an actor when I was about I can't remember twenty four or something, and and you know I had some great times as you can see. But, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me at one point that, that I was spending an awful lot of my time kind of pretending to be Chinese, pretending to be a white person's idea of a Chinese person, and sometimes even a Japanese person, which is bizarre when you think about it. But it's not so bizarre because because I grew up in this kind of provincial town. I was mixed race. My father was from Singapore. My father was dragged out of Singapore when he was eight years old, and I don't think his mental health ever recovered from it. So I was culturally quite bereft. And at school, they would have this song they would sing at us, Chinese, Japanese, Dirty Knees, what are these? All the racist kids would sing that. So I had no idea what I was. You know, I'd ask my dad, and he didn't really know. You know, they, people come to me in the playground and say, you Chinese? I go, I oh, sort of. Are you Japanese? Yeah, yeah, sort of. You, you know, then later on you find out these these two countries are very, very different. And actually, they fought wars against each other, and you, 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 it's just very, very confusing. And um, you know, and 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 I I was working as an actor, like I say, and a lot of the time, you, you know, I found the dialogue we were given to say was quite stilted. You know, there was a lot of um, my father is a very proud man. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know how you make that sound cool. There's no way of making that sound cool. And and, and we, we would have all these rehearsals, you know, and, and, and we'd be in the rehearsal room, um, like, like, like literally figure out, should, should we be bowing to each other? Do, do, are we allowed to touch each other? What, and, and certain actors were, 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 would, would appoint themselves as a cultural expert in the room saying, well, you know, my, my uncle's from, from Hong Kong and, and he would never do this. And, you know, no Chinese person would ever do that. And you go, well, well there's 1.4 billion people in China. You know, you tell me no, no, none of them, not one of them would pick up the credit card with one hand. What is this? 
it, it was just a, a bizarre thing. And and then, you know, so I started like branching out from that little bit and I, and I, I became a, a, a writer. I'll never forget one bit of feedback I got. I was doing a writer's course at Royal Court Theatre, which is really fancy new writing theatre, one of the most famous new writing theatre in the world. Re really fancy. And, uh, you know, with one bit of feedback, I wrote this mad play and, and, and one bit of feedback I got was, your knowledge of Chinese culture and Chinese history and Chinese theatre history is very impressive. And I wrote back, no, my my knowledge of Google is very impressive, you know, because I don't know anything about any of these things, you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know what, what we're talking about is, is I suppose is there's orientalized ideas and everything, everything in Britain is kind of orientalized when it comes to East and Southeast Asia, I feel. And I feel that sometimes it's very tempting for us to kind of play that orientalized idea back because it kind of works. It kind of works with, with, with a certain strata of white middle class society. And especially in you think it's supposed to be the progressive industry, the theater, the entertainment, you think those people think they're really impressive, you know, they think they're much cooler than all of us, you know, and they're so not. They they totally, you know, it's like it's like, could you could you sound more Chinese? Until you, you you sound you end up sounding like like you know so I would, I would do an impersonation of my grandmother you know and but it's not enough for them they go you could more 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 until, until you end up sounding like no human being I've ever heard you know the most ridiculous things you, you know and I, I've got a friend in uh, Malaysia called Gavin Yap he's like me he's mixed race and his grandmother lives here he, he said to me you know whenever I'm in England Daniel I, I see Chinese people on the TV there they're not no Chinese people I've ever seen in my life I said no this is absolutely true this is absolutely true well, I got one minute yeah um so so I, I mean I, I I did some research for this thing uh, I've got this thing coming up in the, in the Kaki Lang festival we've got a big festival coming up um Kaki Lang is basically East and Southeast Asian arts company there's this thing I wrote called every dollar is a soldier with money you're a dragon um, um, it's a long title. I'm really sorry, but but the, you know because because I, I go back into all the history of Chinese immigration to this country, and and I found out that that, that really you know what we were originally was the Huaxia, apparently the beautiful grandeur people that, that that you know lots of us were poor, so we may have been beautiful, we weren't very grand, and and we began on the central plains around the Yellow River, but then you know m my ancestry is from southern China, so it's debatable whether any part of my ancestral DNA has ever been in the central plains. So you can come and see the show and hear more about it. It's some really cool music, really cool music. Musicians and, and I'm sure you'll have brilliant questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you for that card. That's really helpful. Thank you. How do I am? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm just conscious of time. So I need to move on to Karen. Karen Harris, the last but definitely not the least. She is um, our intercultural communication trainer at UAL, not just Hunter St. Martin. And Karen also is a, um, a founder of the UAL Language and Arts Project and many, many, many other amazing projects she's working on. I'm going to over to you, Karen. Okay, you can hear me now. That's perfect. Great. So, uh, so yes, hello. So I'm Karen, and I am absolutely intrigued by the multitudinous artistic possibilities that we have when we play with language. Um, now, I, I guess my fascination with you know, comparative languages and translation probably started in quite early childhood. Um, my family are Jewish. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of the old Jewish language, which is called Yiddish. Now, very few people speak fluent Yiddish anymore. The language is pretty much dying. However, a lot of Jewish people do use little bits of Yiddish when they're speaking, um, especially with other Jewish people who are also familiar with these words. Because what we find is that sometimes there are things that we want to express where English just doesn't quite do it. English just doesn't quite have that nuance of meaning um, and those subtleties, um, whereas Yiddish does. Um, I'll give you a lovely example. There's a word we have, broigus. Um, you say, are you broigus with me? And it kind of means, are you annoyed with me? Are you really you know, annoyed and not talking to me? Have I done something to upset or offend you? But there's something about that word broigus which is so lovely. And it just encapsulates that idea of somebody being really, really annoyed with somebody else. 
Um, and so we, there isn't quite an equivalent in, in, in English. And, um, and yeah, that's why we, we love using those little, little bits and pieces, those little fragments of a dying language when we're, when we're talking amongst ourselves. Um, so, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. I also speak Russian and I found that um, there are certain words in Russian that don't, where there isn't a direct equivalent in English. There's a lovely word, um, um, veselitsa, which kind of means to have fun, to have a good time, but it's not quite like that. It's, I don't know, to make merry. As you can see, I can't even translate it into English because there is no direct translation. So, um, and I'm sure that, you know, it's like you, you can think, you know, it's like in your own language that there may be words and concepts which are just not directly translatable into English. And sometimes you struggle to find a near equivalent. And in that struggle to find that equivalent, there can be a lot of pleasure. It's part of the playfulness of language, I think. Now, um, with translation, I always feel that I often feel that translators are unsung heroes um, who deserve a lot more credit than they're often given. Um, for example, this wonderful book here, uh, Solitaire Mystery, by a Norwegian author called Jostein Garda. The language is so beautiful. It's like looking into the heart of a dream. It's beautiful. It's exquisite. And when I read it, I can't believe, I can't bring myself to believe that the person who put those lovely words together is not the same as the person who created the story. It all seems to be one to me. And yet, the name of the translator is not on the cover. You have to look deep inside the book to find, you know, well, not that deep inside, within the first few pages, to find the name of the translator. They're unsung heroes, not given full credit. Similar thing with this wonderful book of um, Russian um, poetry as well. Again, you have to look very, very deep inside it to find the name of the translator. Um, not so, I've actually got, I mean, we'll talk maybe about this one a little bit later. I've got this wonderful book of Chinese poetry here, and here the translator has been credited on the cover. Um, and there's actually some uh, very, very interesting notes by the translator um, in this book, but we might might discuss that a little bit further uh, later on. So, um, yeah, as I say, I think that language translation and all things related to it. There's so many creative possibilities, so much fun to be had with it. And yeah, look forward to exploring that a little bit more today. Thank you. This translator obviously has a better agent than the other translator. Daniel, wait for your turn. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you all very much. We we do have some questions sent in, you know, in advance, um, conscious of time as well, because um, we didn't tell you before, Diana, you didn't tell them. We kind of like save it for the last. We have refreshment after this. So I need to make sure we finish on time. I'm hungry. Um, so I'm going to forward this question to all of you. Um, first one, I can only pick maybe two. So really, can a language ever really, really, really be translated? What might be lost or perhaps gained in translation? Nikki? Mm. Uh, or whoever want to go first? Uh, I, 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 yes, it can be translated. Yes, something will be lost in the sense that the reader of the translation will not get precisely the same Okay. Uh, is that okay? Can you hear me? All right. Um, impression will not read the text in exactly the same way as the reader of the original, but that's not a reason not to do it. And what might be lost? Um, uh, I suppose typically it will be things like cultural concepts, the, the things which are difficult, the words which are difficult to translate, which you're not entitled to write a whole paper about or even put in a lengthy footnote about. Historical, I mean, a mention of something like the equivalent of Father Christmas, which you don't have to explain in English, 
because we all have resonances of Father Christmas in our heads and sometimes our hearts too. But which so the equivalent in other languages, things which are deeply culturally embedded. But that's not a reason not to translate. We do it anyway. Right. Who's want to go first? Next. Any volunteers? Oh, sorry. Any volunteers? Green light? Green light? Andre? Or if yeah. no one else is speaking, I'm just going to say that, uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's something will be lost, but something will also be found, I, I guess. What the title? And that's the title. Yeah, there you go. I got the title of the symposium right. But I think my, stu my students, so I'm seeing it from the point of view of like visual, like translation into a visual language, I guess maybe I can't say that it's always found but what is looked for it's an access a form of accessibility that is more immediate so i but i don't know how how and whether at all that is also achievable using a, a totally verbalized translation because i think part of the issues that we discuss on the course is whether images actually allow you to get to meaning faster than words mm -hmm. and so you know th that's that's what the students are often looking for like a, a type of visual language that communicates in a more immediate way than than the words is that what you call infographics <laughs> it's not all Stuff i don't think like it's that. only about info i think it's it, infographics is part of that yeah but i think there's more than there's more than that there's sometimes really the attempt to look for a fully uh, developed visual language that cuts cuts the need for translation in a way um, but not for the need for the translators but <laughs> yeah no um yeah that I, yeah that's from my point of view thank you yeah i, I was only going to say uh thank you yeah, I was only going to say it's interesting. There's a, there's a play by Anton Chekhov called The Cherry Orchard, which is which is a lot of critics think it's the best play ever written. Uh, there's a scene at the end where yeah, I mean, you can the three sisters. I I personally prefer the three sisters. I I like Uncle Vanya better actually, but but there's a character in it called Fares, is an old butler, I believe, and at the end of the play, he's left in the house on his own, and I suppose it's kind of symbolism for the changing, the passing of the time, and the change, you know, Russia, the old Russia fading away, and the new Russia coming, and he he has something he says again and again, and it's usually translated as funny old nothing, silly old nothing, referring to himself. Apparently, that's a Russian word that is very, very, very difficult to render, you know, to translate. I have to look back in the yeah. remember for sure. And that, that you, you know, there, there's always something like that. Like in Singapore, there's an expression, uh, which is kasu, which is literally scared to lose. But there's a whole kind of cultural thing there about, about being on edge all the time and constant anxiety. Singaporeans, like, they'll go anywhere. Uh, I have to get there first. Like, kasu, kasu, kasu. I, I, scared to lose. It, it just goes beyond the words in a weird kind of way, and and I just think it's it's always the 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 challenge when you're when you're writing anything, and 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 if I'm writing about Chinese girl like I did in the in the Forgotten the World War One play, I didn't want them to sound like they were English, but at the same time I didn't want them to sound Orientalized. You know, this is me writing my own dialogue, so translating somebody else's is even harder. You know, in a sense, but but that that is always a challenge, I think. Right. Can I be heard? Yes, I can be heard. Great. Um, yeah, so I'd like to actually mention something about the concepts of things being found in translation, not only lost, but actually found. And this is a point where I bring in this wonderful book, which I alluded to earlier. Um, so the um, the original poet was um, a woman called Florence Chia Ying Ye. 
and um, the translator, I'm going to give him his credit, um, Tommy Tao, Tommy W.K. Tao, and he's written some notes at the back, and the notes are really, really fascinating because he talks about the whole translation process, this very, very delicate, very subtle thing about translating poetry and how much you're trying to replicate the exact um, meaning and, you know, the, the atmosphere and the kind of rhythm patterns of the the original and how much you can kind of kind of take your own poetic license and be a little bit more free and make your own judgments it's very very fascinating notes here and I just like to read up something that he says um he says um Yeah, um, I'm not going to read that whole paragraph, but he talks about um, the kind of flexibility that he uses when making his artistic decisions about how to translate these poems um, into, you know, obviously a very, very, very structurally different language. And he said, I would let the rendition take shape and delight in seeing its form emerge as I work on it. And I think that's rather beautiful. It's like saying that the translation has like its own existence, its own life of its own. It's like um, you can imagine the original poem being like a beautiful plant or a tree and the translation being a bud that comes from that tree. And then, you know, that takes root and that takes on its own life, its own kind of sort of independent or maybe semi-independent life. And he mentioned a poem um, called Tree Laden with Snow. And he said that what he did, he, well, he said, occasionally I would discover a compelling new shape or form emerging from the English words. For example, in Tree Laden with Snow, uh, my English rendition is nine lines of free verse, center aligned, forming the shape of a snow laden treetop. Um, I mean, if I open it at that page, and I don't know. So people will, oops. can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. I don't know if people can see that, but um, you might be able to make out the text is kind of that kind of top heavy shape. So it's in the shape of um, a kind of treetop, which is laden with snow. You've got that top heaviness there. And I think that's rather beautiful because what he did was he took the poem and in his translation, he turned it into basically an example of concrete poetry where the form, the, the shape of it reflects the content. So I think that's an example of where something new can be found in, in the translation and where it can become like, like a bud taking on its own, its, its own independent life. I'll just make a comment, I guess. Um, when I think of translating or translation itself, it always reminds me of this really old, I don't even know where I you know, heard it from, but philosophical question, like when you're fixing something, for example, like a car, and when you replace every parts of it into something you know, new to fix it, in the end, like if you continue that process in the end, you'll have another car, but is that car the same as the one before? Um, I think to me, translation is something like that. Like, although, yeah, it's very different, you know, but, and also I kind of think it think of it as like creating like a parallel universe almost because the two works, the original version and the translated version never really go on top of each other, but they always are, stay, remain in parallel to each other. And I guess in that way, what's gained in the process of translation is the conversation between the two works and how the different contexts really converse with each other. And, and yeah, what is lost is lost, but as Nikki said, and everyone else agreed, I think it is still worth translating, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I do have another question, but then again. I have questions from the audience. Yes, from yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, okay, so I will, because we can continue the conversation, but I need to get this out, these two. Um, this is um, maybe, it's more, you know, for Nikki and Daniel, but then Daniel touched touch on it. So it's more, more you, no pressure. Thank you. So what is the most challenging aspect of translating fiction narrative 
narratives from a different culture into English. The most challenging. Um, a lot depends on the text. In fact, everything depends on the text. So I don't think that the language is the determinator, the, uh, is the factor which is going to determine how difficult the challenges are. It's, it's how it's been written, what it's been written about, what it says, what the voice is, uh, and how you put that into English. We, I mean, you can talk, we, we've talked today about many different languages and they all have huge difficulties, but also huge rewards when you translate. Can't be more specific than that. <laughs> Okay, so I think that this is um, we can okay. Let's 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 do this first. Um, so this is more for Marconi at UAL or San Jose Martin. Um, so what do you think is recorded? This huh? this, this event is recorded. Okay, I still need to ask. What do you think UAL is doing well in terms of facilitating intercultural language? What do you think should be improved or could be improved? Because it just reminded me that this is recorded. <laughs> I mean, we can add it. We can add it. In yeah. Moment. No, no. Let's, it, let's, yeah. no. I think the I can't really. I don't think I can speak for for the UAL. But um, I mean, I I only my experience of the UAL is within St. Joseph Martins. Um, but I think the UAL is is doing a number of good things to promote intercultural dialects. And this symposium is one of them. And I think, but yeah, no, no, but thank you, thank you for, uh, for organizing it. But I also want to say, I was actually a student here. Uh, be awesome. Before, yeah. Um, before being a teacher. And I think things have improved since I was a student. So obviously, you know, there, you yeah. Know, when was it? Uh, a ago. long, yeah, few, yeah, over five years ago. <laughs> I mean, it last century, effectively, <laughs> but not a century ago, but last century. Older than you yeah. But I think so. I remember introducing myself um, as an Italian to the person who, at the time, was my course director, and the answer was, "Oh, I love Italy." Buenos dias, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many of you speak Italian and Spanish, but there's, you know, there's a trick there to be careful to. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, the, that type of disattention happens much less, I think. We are, we are all more careful and, and, and genuinely interested in cultural differences. So I think that's, that's one of the things that we are doing better. Thank you. Indeed. Oh, it's just true. Okay. Um, well, I'm obviously not on um, the other side of the table, but as someone from the student body, I guess I really do appreciate a lot of discussions around topics that are relevant to intercultural um, dialogue, such as decolonization, decentralization, and as um, we already talked about like this kind of event, I think does feel like the institution is recognizing our presence. So I do appreciate it, um, but I'm not sure if I'm the right person to speak really representing the student body because as a PhD student, I'm very distant from the rest of the student body. So I, I am really curious of like how others are feeling about this, but um Compared to when I was um, in New York, for example, which was like three, four years ago, I think there are much more active discussions about these kind of topics and intercultural dialogues in general, which I definitely see as a good sign. And, and yeah. 
correct. Before, before I asked, you know, Karen, because she's intercultural communication trainer, I'm going to fold this question to you guys. You know, what do you think could be improved? Anyone? You can ask, you know. Don't be shy. No, you have. Yeah. I, yeah, um, I, of course I don't speak for all of the students. I can't do that. Oh, um, it's recording. I'm too for my fire. Um, I guess I it's based on my course only. Uh, when we have to join the language development class. Uh, it's nice in a way. It's like improve our speaking English skill, though. Like we did have to pass the IELTS test, which is an English um certificates requirement in order to got into the school. So at the start, I felt it a little bit. Um, how can I say it? Like ridiculous to join the class, though. So, I still join and it's, um, it's supposed to be like improving and uh, kind of like inspiring you to learn though the class is a bit uh, quiet and a bit like not really related to the subject that I study. So maybe that could be improved. Though the class only take the first year of my MA. It's not taking the second year, so it's not much of a problem. Um, yeah, and maybe like, is there any chance that like for for me personally, I found fine art really need to know how to communicate, and we don't really have any kind of class that help our to communicate. Like I'm a freelance writer, that's why I write for publication. That's why how I know about like writing um, like press and stuff like that. And I found it really helpful for like an artist career that we can like improve ourselves in order to like get into more in writing. Um, yes, I think maybe that this. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, thank you. Thank you. I have, yeah, I remember. Okay, we will talk and I will speak to some people, including Karen. Um, so, Karen, do you want me to repeat the question? Um, okay, yeah, it's working now. Um, okay, wow. Um, things where we're doing well, things where we could improve. I often felt that there was a bit of a gap um that um for a long time we didn't really have any kind of sort of platform or forum where students could come together students from all different nationalities all different cultures linguistic backgrounds and could actually explore language together i mean yes we've got language development classes for people to improve their academic english and so on which and you know the classes are great absolutely brilliant but in terms of just being able to explore language, explore each other's languages, introduce other people to your language in that lovely atmosphere of like mutual curiosity, respect, friendship. We didn't seem to have anything like that. Um, so that's why I took trying to um, address that by setting up things like, you know, the, um, the poetry club and the language art projects, which incidentally um, look out in your email in um, a few days time, I'll be sending out like a mass email to all the students asking if people want to get involved in this year's language art project. So, so look out for that. Hopefully that should be coming to your inboxes via, via Moodle sometime very soon. Um, but there are, there are also some other great things going on in the language center. One of them is the language exchange thing that we have, which um, um, I believe that a Moodle email was already 
sent out about that, whereby if you're interested in learning another language, they'll pair you up with uh, one or more language partners, other students, and you can like do a kind of get, get together, meet for coffee or whatever, and have a like, language exchange together, um, which is really, really lovely. And again, I think that's um, it's a beautiful thing to do, a way of you know, bringing people together in like I say, that sort of atmosphere of, you know, curiosity, friendship. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certainly scope for uh, really, really in increasing what we do in that regard. Thank you very much. We have a little bit over time, kind of, as we start a few minutes um, later. Um, so we need to wrap up because I'm hungry. No, not really. We need to wrap up. So thank you again for the panels. Um, thank you for you all coming raising this cold weather. And then thank you for the online people still there. Thank you. So um, thank you to Liam Green, who, you know, organized this with, with you know, um, Diana, Vianti, and then Zoom. So I hope we will have more dialogues, more events like this. And if student, student, or anyone, if you think you know anything, how, what is it again? What do you think? UL could be improved. Send a, don't send me email. Maybe send an email to student service, your tutor, your course leader, program director, or Karen Harris. Um, so, okay, I'm going to say thank you again. And let's stop recording. And we will continue the conversation with Spring World.